How would you describe uh, your movie? I would say it's a film about recognizing the humanity in the other. Um, and in this case, is recognizing the humanity on a victimizer. Um, so for me, it's a film about recognition, but it's also a film about resistance. I think it's a film about resisting violence. That's very generally said. If uh, you would have to pitch me the story, okay. What is the, story? <laughs> <laughs> the story is about a 22-year-old girl. She's a fine arts student at a public university. She has a very tight relationship to her dad, who is a sci political science teacher. And one day they are driving back home. And once they arrive at their home, he gets killed uh, by a young boy. And um, uh, Paula, who is the main character, she gets a glimpse of his face while he drives away on a motorbike. Um, they go to the institution, prosecutor's office, everything you have to do when you're a victim. Nothing really happens. The system has no compassion whatsoever on this family. It's another case in a long list of Colombian crimes. And two months later, she accidentally sees Jesus at a bar. And she, that is not a violent person, doesn't come from a violent context in general, she decides to get to know this young man in order to avenge her dad's uh, death. And in that process, uh, she starts realizing that this kid that is 23 years old as her um, is a victim of a corrupt and violent society. So she will have to decide whether she Resist that violence, or she continues the cycle of violence. Whether she kills him or not. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. <laughs> what was your motivation to make this movie? The main uh, motivation it's a very personal one. Uh, my my dad was killed when I was 22 years old, so I think the the film became a compile of reflections and thoughts um, of all these years that uh, we've been through these and it ends up being like also like a homage and a, and a love letter to to him uh, it took me a long time to write I was already a film student when when he was killed um, I never imagined I would do a film that was inspired in that and at the beginning this was just like some writing exercise that I did um, after I had this dream with this young man who told me my name is Jesus, I'm 23 years old and I kill your dad. And that kind of triggered the story, so I started writing these texts that used to be called Conversations with Jesus, Conversations with Jesus, and it was mainly like a description of this character. And then, I, I don't know, with the years it just became a necessity to tell this story um, based on what was happening to us. Mm -hmm. Was it uh, a painful process or were you totally professional? Wow. Oh no, <laughs> very painful and that's why it took us so long and that's why I started writing with a co-writer in 2012. He's Alonso Torres, he's a very amazing um, script writer uh, from Colombia, a really good friend. And yeah, like I, I don't think I would have done it without him. Like there would be no film without him. Um, because it was very painful and because sometimes I felt it was almost like irresponsible like to expose myself in that way and the pain of my family in a way so I stopped and go and stopped and then when when he jumped in the project it kind of like flew more like better. Mm -hmm. The father in the film is a left-wing uh, teacher, professor at university, if I got it right. Yeah, for me it was important that um, he, in the, in the movie, he's just like a political science teacher, um, like, a, like he, he's talking about Michel Foucault, so yes. we obviously know that that, he, that that doesn't come from like a right-wing <laughs> uh, man. Uh, but for me it was important that uh, this was just a man, like a man that inspired his students, inspired his family, who had a very open relationship with, in this case, with, with her daughter. Uh, when they are going in a car scene, they just speak about like everyday stuff and um, she's very open to him, it's like he's her best friend. So for me it was important that we didn't talk about this 
left-wing uh, human rights activists because I feel that that at the end it it has to hurt just because he was a man that inspired people around not because he was an, a big leader who affected like a really big community he's just a man and it should be painful enough because it's a man and uh, it's a man that is a father is responsible and it's a loving dad and and that for me was very important not to make it like these um, mm -hmm. activists or whatever no it's 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 just a man <laughs> in the film who was your father my father was that. <laughs> my father was a lawyer, he was a teacher as well, a very center uh, person like in, in, in the political terms, like he wasn't... He was not a left? No, he wasn't a left wing. He was uh, um, affiliated to some party? No, not affiliated to any political party. Uh, but for him it was important that we, as his uh, son and daughter, my brother and me, were always very conscious about the kind of country where we live in and about politics and be sensitive and I think his most revolutionary thing that he did with us is that he made us believe like genuinely that everyone is equal and everyone deserves exactly the same and that in a society like Colombian society that is so elitist and divided and unequal that is revolution, you know, when your dad tells you I don't care who you hang out with, I don't care from which neighborhood he or she is from, as long as he or she respects you as a person and you like him, he's welcome in this house always. And so I grew up in a very open family without no boundaries and that's why we, I could make a film like Killing Jesus because I can recognize that humanity in the others and I know Medellin very well because I never had those boundaries that people in Colombia have in the cities like I don't go there or that's so dangerous. That, that <laughs> means you are going everywhere in Medellin or you were going everywhere. Yeah, I, I the no go zones. Yeah, like Medellin for me it's uh, I have a very strange relationship to the city and I think that's that comes out in the in the film. The city is another character and it's I know it very well and I've never been like oh don't go there. No, I, I know the city very well well. I have friends everywhere and it will always uh, provide a lot of inspiration because it's such a strange place. Crazy city. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, what were the biggest um, uh, challenges while making this movie? Um, there was first, I think, um, getting the funding was really hard, <laughs> and then uh, casting was was for me like the main thing and I, I always said to my producers, if I'm not um, sure about the people, I'm, I prefer to give back the money of the funding. Like I knew these uh, needed like really special characters and I knew that I wanted to work with non-professional actors. So it was like an eight month casting, then we canceled it and we stopped everything. And then one day I saw Natasha entering a the theater, like she was gonna watch a movie and I sat behind her and I was like, this girl is perfect for the film. You saw her just like that sitting yeah. in the movie in the audience? Yeah, <laughs> in the what, audience. What, 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 what was the reason that you saw this is the one? I saw her when we were entering into the theater and my boyfriend said to me like, she has something that reminds me of you and we were, were like, oh, the, the film and um, and then I sat behind her and as the movie, a documentary by Luis Ospina kept going, I just looked at her and then the documentary is really long and she left the theater and was like, oh my God, I lost it. And then two months later, I saw her again downtown and I run and I follow her and I grab her by the hair mm -hmm. and, and I said, I saw you and I sat behind you and she thought, oh my God, she's so crazy. And <laughs> I finally convinced her to give me her number and now she's here and then Giovanni Giovanni is Kelly, what, what does she do in life by the way She's a fine arts student oh, at the yeah. same university as the <laughs> girl like she's yes. just perfect for the character and a girl with a lot of sensibility she doesn't want to continue acting she just think it was an amazing yes. experience yes. and that's yes. it And then with Giovanni he is Jesus like he is exactly as that character and um, one of our casting assistants saw him at a, 
at a park and approach him and he thought it was like the secret service from the police mm -hmm. so he said another name because he had just come out of jail because of a uh, drug trafficking like a small trafficking offense so he was like paranoid <laughs> But he ended up going to to the casting to an interview. So when he sat down, I was like, "Oh, hi, Steven. And he's like, "No, no, no, no. My name is Giovanni, but I thought you were from the Secret Service. I'm sorry." Mm. And then he started talking, and then suddenly he said to me, "Sometimes I get really tired of life." And in those texts that I told you, conversations with Jesus, there was a point where this character said. Although I'm really young, I'm very tired of life. And for me, that was the, the key thing that he said that day, that I was like, this is my, my, my guy. And then I put them together and magic happened. And I knew I had a he's, film. He's a small stock or a small dealer. Uh, in um, Giovanni, um, Giovanni has, he doesn't have like a family. Um, his dad was killed and Uh, his mom was very young and so he grew up between his grandmother that he adores and the streets. So he was easily used by the criminal system um, to work <laughs> for them. So he, he was in jail because of a small drug offense and um, he's, um, he's a hustler and he's um, He knows the streets and it's a, a, a young man that struggles and so smart and has suffered so much and still has so much humanity in him, but yeah. Did, did they have, I mean, did you write them the texts or did they improvise? Um, we worked for two months before we started shooting uh, uh, with a friend of mine that is like a drama teacher um, and He's amazing, his name is Duan, and he started like making all these exercises for them to relax in front of the camera, for them to find like a landscape of emotions in their bodies, like to give them tools. And then I read them the story as if it was like a long tale. Um, and then when it came the time to, to shoot, uh, we shot it chronologically. Mm, and every day they will learn a little bit about the story and I would just make up the situations and they will just interpret them and talk as they talk. Sometimes when I needed a line that I wanted I would try to make them like take that line as if it was theirs but it was very beautiful because if you read the script and you compare it with the scenes they talk exactly as the characters but it's because I knew that that language and I, I, I knew things like that would come. So, but they never, they never had a script. Mm -hmm. Was my notion right that his dialect was even more, I mean, uh, slang than what she was talking? Yeah, she's a, a, a more educated I, girl. Like she's yeah. a, she's a street girl and yeah. she likes it and she hangs around and she knows everyone a while, uh, around and she smokes joints and she has like this hip hop friend. and. But, uh, but she's a very well-educated girl, just as Natasha is in real life. Uh, with, uh, although she uses slang, Giovanni's slang, it's hardcore, like, it's great. Like, I never thought, a lot of people were like, oh, but what are you gonna do? No one's gonna understand, like, even Spanish-speaking countries. Me, I didn't understand anything. Yeah. And I know Colombia right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, in San Sebastián, they, they, they put it with Spanish oh, subtitles, yes, yes. like they do with a lot of films, even in Colombia, mm -hmm. like, Chilean films are really hard to understand mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. But I was like, no, I prefer to have subtitles than to take the truth Absolutely. out of that language. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Was he difficult to work with or was he just very soft? And with him? Whatever you said. <laughs> with him? To no, he, he is amazing. He's so responsible. Mm -hmm. I said to him one day, like, you're so responsible. And he said, I've been a soldier. I see. <laughs> Did you shoot also in the, in, in, in the hot quarters, in the hot uh, places in Medellin? Uh, when you say hot places, it's well, like... Hot, uh, 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 calientes los lugares. Uh, uh, como de peligrosos. Yes, mm -hmm. the, the dangerous. Yeah, we were, we shot in like 15 different neighborhoods because I also wanted to build up a city that only exists in the movie that is like just to show how we're all the same, like no matter if I'm shooting north side or east, it's the same. 
And what we did is, um, yes, in, in some of these neighborhoods, there is their own authorities. And we try to be respectful of any kind of situation that they live in. Like, it, it wasn't my job to go there and um, destroy whatever routine they have. Like, I, I, I believe that filmmaking needs to be respectful with, because it's so invasive. You know, you get there with the crew and lights and everything, and you just like alterate all the universe. So we, um, so we you always have to find the boss of a neighborhood and sometimes, sometimes at least ask how things work um, and be respectful of it but what we did is we tried to get the communities involved so every time we were in a neighborhood if we needed to paint some walls so the kids will come and help us mm -hmm. all the extras mm -hmm. are from the neighborhood that we shot every day um, the kids with the bikes like everything so we were we got the community very involved they loved it they loved the process they were very proud about what the film was was telling and they enjoyed it and we were welcome everywhere. So even though we were at some spots that are known for being hot spots, <laughs> um, we didn't have no problem at all. Never afraid? No, sometimes it was like, especially downtown, you know, like it's, it's funny because a lot of people think, oh, maybe up in the slums, it's, but downtown, there's a lot of robbery and because it's so many people you have to be more alert. So I think downtown was the hardest part for us to shoot because it's too many people and there's like a high speed dynamic the whole time. Um, but, uh, but no, we, we were safe <laughs> always. <laughs> Where do you live now actually? In Medellin. In Medellin. Yes. <laughs> On one side, I mean, I was hearing about all the, the work that has been done and that Medellin is so much better. Uh, it is. <laughs> Colombia had the peace process, FARC is the, FARC, the biggest guerrilla is not fighting anymore. Yeah. And uh, yesterday I read in El País, the leading Spanish uh, newspaper, that more refugees from Colombia are coming to Spain because you've got all the demilitarized crazies, uh, you've got uh, Los Comités de Autodefensa, the, the, the right wing. Uh, it's a very uh, difficult t time so it, period. It, it, it seems that Colombia is uh, uh, very dangerous at the moment. It's I wouldn't say, I just think violence has many faces. And we've seen, we're facing a new face right now, like um, it's no longer that very extravagant violence we had in the 80s with the cartel that was almost like a performance of violence. It's so horrible. And then we have uh, all the guerrilla versus paramilitaries kind of war, which was another type of violence. And then the cities have a very different kind of violence than the rural areas. And I think the, the rural areas have, the, they know what, what's war like <laughs> more than us, I think, from the cities. So a lot of people have asked me exactly the same like you, like we heard that Medellin has such a, um, like important social process and it has. And that's when I say that Medellin is such a strange place, it's because of that. It's because it's the city where probably the highest social investment in the last couple of years. We had like two really good uh, administ local administrations that put education first and infrastructure for the neighborhoods. That's all going well. But we're still very violent because we inherited violence, because we're still unequal because there's not the same opportunities, because you have a society that tells you, that shows you all these needs, you know, but at the, at the end is the capitalist world. <laughs> and all these kids trying to go there without doing a process. And, and um, as long as drugs are still illegal, there's always going to be a war in Colombia. That's Forget about it. That's what they have to learn in the States. Last in the question. States and in everywhere, like we're condemned to violence out of the human desire of taking drugs. <laughs> so it's very stupid. Very simple. Uh, you said when we started that this is a film against violence after your father was shot 
uh, didn't you feel the, the, the urge to see uh, his killer killed or uh, uh, violent, violently punished and uh, how, how did you get over that? That's, how, that's why this film is born because I was so shocked that when dad was killed I recognized that darkness inside me. You know when you have a system uh, like a justice system that has collapsed it's not even that it's corrupt or anything, it is in some ways, but it's also that it has collapsed because it's so big what we've been through and so violent. So when you don't have that compassion of that justice system and you don't have that company um, and, and, and you're in this savage world, um, you, you recognize the feeling of revenge inside you. And that's why for me the film is about resisting because I think at the end we end up resisting our own darkness. And that's I think what Colombians should do. We've been killing each other for 50 years. It's like a never ending act of revenge. So that is human and that is there, but we, we need to stop this.